Ik ga iets hier zo zoek. Da, ok. Ok, nu moet je het bijbel wat maken. Dat is het. Want ik moet, als ik nu preek, dan maak ik die schrift groot. Als ik lees bij de juist, dan maak ik hem fijn. Ja. En ik kan mooi zien, als ik hier zo sta. Dan lees ik perfect. Maar als ik begin naar aan te komen, mijn bro aan te zetten, dan moet ik hem aan en af te halen. Ja, zo, kom eens gaan aan. En uh, ik, uh, ik denk jullie stem samen met mij ons leven in baie interessante tijden. Het is krikkelijk challenging tijden. En um, ons uh, um, een is een profetische boek. Um, nie net profetisch, dus wel is ook het bij doctrine in. So, die leerstelling van Paulus is ook alles daar inge, inge, interwoven. And, um, but it's the most interesting book and the most accurate book because it's God's prophecies. Um, and, um, and, uh, and what it does do, so like, or, or says we say, like we've drawn, but it's me to Tell us again, one more time, okay? It just tells us about, particularly about this 2000 year period, in fact more than that, no, 2007 and 1000. Revelation talks essentially about, essentially about that period. I think at Bethes as well as you have to say, we are, the interesting part is we've lived through the 2000. We're going to leave before the seven years. And so we're about to know all things. So we all know what it's like to be a lady, huh? To know all things. <laughs> the moment the trumpet sounds, we will know all things. Absolutely all things. Can you imagine that? But we also are living in the most privileged time because we, we've got hindsight. So it's, it's exciting. It's beautiful. We've lived through those 2,000 years. Um, and, um, and, and um, that's the joy and, and the, the beauty of it. And the, but the sad part is why did God really even show us this? He didn't have to show us this. It would have happened anyway, without us having knowledge. Not so? When, when, if you... Daar by jou onder die hoene rokke, jy vir tel nie aan die aand wat vir precies wil aangaan. Men hoef nie te weet nie, is dit nie. Uh, hulle moet nie die vloer vir, jy sal seker maak, daar is geld die einde van die man, wil met die betaal. Hoe dit gebeur, is nie hulle probleem nie. And God could really treat us like that, said, you know what, you just carry on, don't worry. I'm under control, but he, he actually... He actually explained us. And of course, there's in the, there's the book of John where it says, um, we, we're, the, we're the sons, not servants. Because the servant doesn't know what the master is doing. But the, the son knows what the master is doing. And so, he gave it to us. And of course, I believe... I believe for a couple of reasons he gave us all that information. Um, I, I think we can say that um, one of the reasons is it confirms uh, a lot of God's word in other places. It authenticates God's word. 
So God always authenticates his word. You know that. He always does. So like Sunday morning, I on the da Peter Stein to go from the trower of the Christian trower. And I could be vroeg opgestaan en my gedagtes in orde gekry, en toe geer die heren vir my gedagtes, en ek sê ach nie, maar jyre, ek wil nie hierdie goed deel vir oogend nie, vir iets anders deel, iets lekkers en relaxing, jy weet en ek gaan kyk in ander plekke maar ek krij nie die vatplek as dit die rechte woord is so ek sê, ek jy ons samen met die heren moet gaan dan, en um, maar toe ek daar sit, toe leie Johan in die, die liekies, en hy he confirms all the thoughts that I had. Mm. So I had no choice. I had to share what God put in my heart. Mm. And God always confirms His word. Mm. Always. You will find it in your life. He always confirms His word. We don't sometimes like the confirmation, uh, especially when the message, the initial message is not a pleasing one. And then He confirms that, but He'll always confirm it. Uh, and um, and so that's the one thing. Then the other reason I think, you know, we, you know um, so so um, last job. So he confirms. You'll find confirmed in the Bible. In in Revelation, many of of Paul's teachings to the church. So Paul speaks the doctrines of how the church must operate. And as you read the revelation intertwined over there like a golden thread, it's God's confirmation of the doctrine of the word. In other words, how we need to serve God. All right. So it's powerful, very powerful. And, and, and you know, when people come with arguments like, ah, das, das Buche von die Bibel uitgelaat, um, dan, je moet onmiddellijk weet, hy praat so veel nonsens. Want as jy weer een geboor is, en jy is gevoel met enige gees, en jy gaan dier die woord, sal jy sien, hierdie feit, dat hy omself, wat is confirm? Um, Bevestig. Dit is absolutely crazy. En daar is nooit een grapping in ons. Nooit. Ek nog nooit een grapping gevind. So as jy een prinsip in die Nieuwe Testament uh, lees, in die Oud Testament sê, as een beeld sien, En so gaan dit aan, heen en weer, heen en weer, maak jy sê dat waai lees nie. En dis wat vir my so heeltemal duidelik is, dat daar absoluut niks in die woord geloos is. Nooit, 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 nooit. Nooit, nooit, nooit. En meeste van weergebore mense of predikers stem saam. So, so groot dan is dit nie. Ok, so groot, groot, groot prinsie. So nou, net terwijl ons dan aangaan, voor ons aangaan. So how should we live our lives? Um, how should we live our lives? We should make sure that everything we do is confirmed mm. by the brethren. Mm. That's why he gives us the body of Christ. Okay? Because it needs to be confirmed. You can't confirm your own direction. People hate it when I say that. But it's fine. We're about here. I'm, I'm going to buy some lots of cokes. I won't be, so I'll be, be getting cokes. If I get to heaven and I'm wrong on this subject, I will buy the whole of heaven a cook. It's incredibly important. Mm. So people don't like to be connected to a body because it puts you under pressure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Puts you under pressure how you raise your children. Puts you under pressure how you manage your wife. Because if you start mistreating your wife, the brothers are going to come and say, what are you doing? Mm. And you don't like that. What, what do you say? Mm. Uh, and so... And so if you, if, I'm sure you can already paint the picture. All right? Here comes the next reason why I believe God told us. Is to warn us that they spill it. I can't spill on a board. The book of warning is to warn us through the ages. Why? Because he wants to save us. So this book has got confirmation, warning, and salvation. That's what the whole of it's all about. So God lets us know. And He then hides it 
because that's his way. He hides it to the disobedient and he reveals it to the obedient. Remember? He, he spoke, Jesus said, he spoke to the, the, the Israel in parables. So the disciples said, why do you speak to the Israelites in parables? He says, because I don't want them to hear. Because they are hot or wicked and they're hard. And so I will reveal my ways to those who are humble and of a soft heart. And, and um, th this is God's plan, eh? It's God's plan. So, so what do you and I have to do? Well, you've got to make a decision somewhere that you're going to be obedient to God. Something's going to drop in your heart where he says, God, if you say jump, just tell me how high. That's all I'm interested in. But count me. Already I've jumped even before you asked. Next, you've got to assume a position of humility. I was thinking about worship. Chonapit. Someone sent me an apparent Christian song. It clearly wasn't. It had to be spiked with a couple of demons. It was like heavy, heavy metal. I've never listened to heavy metal, but I couldn't believe they called it Christian. Really? So this was like going through my head, and I thought, goodness, I'll play it for you. You won't even know it's Christian. You'll bash your head against the wall like those folks do here. And, 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 and it just, it's a picture of the world we're living in. And, and listen to this carefully. Worship is, by definition, a response of love towards God. That's worship. Godly worship. Right? And I will often say, and of course the word worship means to lean towards to kiss. That's the meaning of the word. And so I always say, in a certain sense, we worship our loved ones when we Tell them that we love them sincerely. And we don't want something, you know. And we tell our children how much we love them. In a kind of a way, it's a response. And and just your response towards them. But modern day worship is all messed up. Because people as for us to worship God, and what worship has become is an experience that I need to now have in worship. No longer about God. So that you hear them say the, the worship was amazing, which has a certain, can, it got a sense of, uh, you know, it can be true when using the right word. But, but worship is actually for God. You should ask Him, did He enjoy that? <laughs> How was that, Lord? <laughs> Not so. But what do we say? Oh, the worship was amazing. I don't know, guys. Something's worrying me. What do you say? So you write that kind of music because you don't like music that glorifies God. I need music that fits in with my genre. Are, 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 you, are, you, on the, are you on the same page? And, and, um, and so it's amazing, you know, and, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. This just came across my path. But um, and so the book is full of warning. Warnings to us. And I don't warnings eh and so just quickly um, and, and so as you look at this timeline or this line this uh, um, we didn't mention last week but it started it this week during this 2000 year period the book of Revelation tells us there's going to be seven churches okay the, well let's put it this way there were, um, the Lord Jesus, God gave a revelation to Jesus, and Jesus gave it to John, and John gave it to us. That's what the Bible says. So the Revel book of Revelation actually belongs to God. Go read it. It says, and the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to him, and he gave to us. How lucky is that? So God said to Jesus, I want to tell you, share a few secrets with you. About the end times. And uh, he says, yeah, I delivered to this revelation. River. And, and, John, and Jesus said to John the Apostle, I just want to share a few secrets with you. Write these things. Write these things that will come to pass. It's an incredible book. Eh? So this is important. So 
In the book of Revelation, listen to this carefully. It's not going to mean much after the rapture. You know why? Because then everything's going to be clear. Um, according to that, you can start your stopwatch. Exactly seven years will be the Battle of Armageddon. And then exactly a thousand years later is going to be the Great White Throne Judgment. Or the uh, Judgment Day. So, the book, the book, I think when I get to heaven, I'm going to read through Revelation first. What do you say? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to know all these things. Because there's still some stuff that's not altogether clear because it hasn't happened yet. But, uh, we, sorry, is anything finally exciting? Can you imagine the moment you're raptured, you know all things. And the whole of God's plan is absolutely clear. You'll, you'll flick through Revelation up in heaven like, ah, oh, so easy. Just look at this. We understand. We see it all. Mm. So it's, we're living in a momentous time. Okay. So there are seven churches. And when he writes to the churches, um, he has, for many of them, he first introduces himself at, in every chapter. He introduces himself by one of his characteristics. Right? And and the last the last church he introduces himself as the Amen. Interesting, isn't it? So what does Amen mean? For bay. So it says and and and, and you can go and read. Must must we give an example? Let me give you a quick example. Let's go to Revelation quickly, chapter two. Starts there, he says, listen to this. And to Angel the Church of Ephesus, these Things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the golden candlesticks. Now the seven stars are defined for us in chapter one. Those are the messengers to the seven churches. So he says, listen to this. In my hand I hold messengers, amongst others, to the churches. That's how he starts. And so the churches received messengers. And, and, and what form did the messengers take? Who are the messengers to the churches? Were well, they people? And in fact, we're all messengers. But the concept is, uh, in every one of us is a gift which qualifies us to be a messenger. So, so in that picture, he was speaking about the seven churches. But, but what we can say is this, is that in God's hands is held all the people who've responded to God and applied themselves as messengers. They held. And I'm telling you guys, no matter how bad it gets, there's always those who remain faithful. Mm. Remember the story of Elijah? Mm. He wanted to give up. He said, I'm the only one who's escaped. He said, no, don't be silly, Brute. Uh, uh, don't be silly, Brute. Uh, this is my game. There's a whole bunch of other prophets that I've hidden away from danger that you don't know about. They're in my hand. And so, and so the church began and God made sure throughout the ages that there would always be some messages, messengers for the church no matter how dark the age was. It's a beautiful beginning, isn't it? And so right at the end, which is in chapter 3, the, book, the church of Laodicea, he says, unto, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write this, saith thee, Amen. The, the end of the story. Not the hello, the amen. The final. The faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation. In other words, the one that began and the one that will be there at the amen and the one that was faithful to make sure there was a witness in between. So that's the last church. Done finished all right and of course if you look at the scriptures this whole concept of warning but who likes warning the one of the worst things to do is to be a preacher it's the hardest job on earth believe me so the, the a normal job i do with my left hand i've concluded i don't care what it is i'll do it with my left hand because long many many reasons but one of the worst things is have to warn people. And especially when there's no contract. 
Because you can't threaten them with being fired. Mm. <laughs> you know, if, if you've got people who work for you, say, I'll fire you. Then all of a sudden they work faster, you know. Mm. Or you tell them, there's no work out there, huh? Do you want to leave? <laughs> no, 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 I'll do my work, I'll do my work. The other day, the one truck driver there at the feedlot phones me. He wants to go to his brother's, aunt's, mother's, sister's funeral. So, of course, I don't allow that. No, it's not, you don't have to allow that. It's mother, moms, sons, uh, uh, children and parents. That's it. Then he says to me, it's going to take about two hours. Which funeral in Africa takes two hours? <laughs> he was lying through his teeth, you know. Are you, are you with me? But I used my authority and I, I, I warned him. I'll fire you and there's other people waiting to take your job. Then all of a sudden, he didn't want to have the funeral anymore. But yeah, this whole concept of warning. Um, and, and, and what you find today, guys, is that because warning is hard on the flesh, people have changed the message and no longer warn. Just like worship is no longer toward God, but towards man. So the whole thing is rigged. Honestly. I heard of a mega church that couldn't have worship because the lights went up. You've got to ask yourself if it's worship. Really? So that was my church. I'd throw the whole band out. So guys, we don't know how to worship in this church. Because if Eskim stops working, then we can't worship. It's a problem with our worship, not the Eskim. What do you say? And just so the warning, the, the, the gospel today has changed Away from being careful, of course, and the, the reason we have to warn is because our enemy is real. <laughs> the wicked one is real, guys. Hey, come on, who? Well, Smith Wheelsworth was a crazy guy. <laughs> he woke up one day and he came, he was petrified. He said, I just saw the devil. <laughs> I just saw the devil and I'm petrified. I don't know if he did, but there are demons. There is a devil. And so that's why there has to be a warning. And so the warning was to the church, okay? And, and so come, I'll remind you of the portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 25, which is the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Remember that? Okay? And I suggest to you, um, it was, for, for many reasons, it was also... It was actually that when Jesus told those parables, he told the parables, that parable, that particular parable, and it was about this 2,000 year period, I'll tell you why I say that, is because chapter 24 um, of, of Revelation is about the end times, and it has a lot to do with the Jews, chapter 24. And after, the, you know, yeah, the next chapter after the Jewish chapter would be the Gentile chapter, and so I would believe that's what 25 speaks about. And he speaks about five virgins and five virgins. Ten virgins, but divided into two. Remember, five wise, five foolish. And so you will know how many gifts are there given to the church of Jesus Christ. There are five gifts given to the church of Jesus Christ. So how does the church operate? By well, five gift ministries. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. That's God's plan. And it's in the Old Testament too. You can go and pick it out there in, in many places. It's not personalities, it's ministries. Not popularity, it's ministries. So already you can see we need to warn people, eh? But what's it gone about? Popularity. And what works? Management systems. Not including everyone. And so, and of course, the devil will always make sure there's a false church. So this speaks about the true church and the false church. So accurate. And so where did, the, where did the, the church end up in that parable? Just before the bridegroom came, what happened? They fell asleep and they had, didn't have enough oil. Now, the oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Right? And so, and so people have substituted things for the Holy Spirit. Substituted things. In a terrible way. In an amazing way. You've seen... Okay. Just quickly. Without wasting too much time. 
There's two ways that we try and substitute for the Holy Spirit. Number one is by natural intellect. The Bible speaks about natural wisdom. So what do we do? We're going to study for seven years. So we can sidestep the Holy Spirit. And we can know the Bible without being saved or full of the Holy Spirit. Right? Unfortunately, it's a harsh reality. That's what it is. And the other way is we sidestep the Holy Spirit by extravagant emotional experiences. And so, and so what they do on this side of the scale, I can't spell extravagant. I'll say amazing. I think I know how to spell amazing. Have you noticed um, the amazing, the amazing extravagant emotional experiences that many churches offer? Friends, you don't understand what's going on out there. And it hasn't changed. And what amazes me is, is educated people that actually get involved in that kind of behavior. Not just, you, yes, so there's dorm. I like you, like you people. There's people just like you. Ladies like you. That become hysterical, roll on the ground, shake like crazy every Sunday. And then they say, that is the Holy Spirit. And that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is essentially around the preaching of God's Word. And around the changing of a life. So you say, oh Renee, this is a very downhearted world. We've got to speak about it. It's in the Bible. And so b between the, the natural intellect, so then they begin to say, with all respect, you can baptize a baby. When the Bible says you need to believe when you get baptized. Then intellectually they try and connect this. It's so convoluted. I promise you. There was not one baby Christian in the whole Bible. Not one. Not one baby was Christian. But somehow they're able to bring that out. Are you with me? Uh, and so on and so forth. And then they'll, oh, they'll go on. They'll tell you the gifts of the Holy Spirit are no longer necessary. Because... When that which is perfect is come, and then they just scrap the whole book of Acts. Intellectually. And then of course, and all I'm saying is, there's such a warning to us today that we're living in. That's why the Lord Jesus wrote this, these, these things for us. And there he tells the parable, and the whole story ends in Matthew 25. It ends with a bridegroom coming. So where are we on this, on this timeline? We're waiting for the bridegroom. We're waiting for the bridegroom. And, and uh, you know, every time we, we, uh, we it was a beautiful wedding, um, beautiful wedding, because a stand was made to glorify God. Weddings can be awful. Because they're supposed to declare Christ in the church. That's the most important thing about the wedding is not the bride or the bridegroom. Because if they're going to be over, they're going to get old and wrinkly and pass, over, pass away. But the bride, the church in Jesus Christ is an eternal union. An eternal union. And we could preach for that for a while. Um, and, and so we are about, we are about to experience the wedding of all weddings the bride is should be the dress should be fitting already no more fittings they're putting the last flowers in the hair the makeup is almost done that's where we're living today right now according to this and we've got hindsight to see it already that's where we're living but we're also living in the most dangerous time for the church when people will fall asleep. They'll be tricked. Like, like the, those five foolish virgins, they were not careful. They never yielded, yielded the warning of being ready. And they, I was, I was sharing uh, on Sunday about the children of Israel where where they they uh, they left Egypt, and they and on their on their journey they must come to contact with a whole lot of heathen nations. So the first one they were all pumped up, 
And the first nation they arrived, I can't remember their name. Um, they asked God, should we go fight? God said, leave them alone. They, they said, what? They were so pumped up and so hyped up off the Red Sea. They said, not to heck, we don't leave these oaks alone. We feel like some fun. And the Bible says, God says, you were presumptuous. And so then these guys beat them. It says they ran away like, like a man runs when the bee chases him, the Bible says. The, the, the sin of presumption. Um, we must be careful. Have you got it? So now listen to this now. And we have shared this already. Okay? In the past. Um, and I just want to summarize it. I want to end with it. So we finish with chapter 2 and 3 then. There's lots we could say. But have you got the concept? All right? Now, guys, you either believe this or you don't. And I believe this more, I believe in this more than uh, Jeanette's uh, medicine I'm taking for my knee that works so well. You know, I believe in this. I believe this with all of my heart. With all of my heart. Uh, and, and I've been challenged in my own heart to make sure that I'm right with God. And to be careful how I walk. Because if, if it ends with a warning, how can I exclude myself? You know? And uh, I think I told you guys on holiday, Lee and I, the Lord kind of spoke to us together and just said to us, get in a word. At the same time, Lee and I were sitting there, well, she came to me and said, you know what, I just feel in my heart, we need to get into the word. So we discipline ourselves and it, it has, it's, it's continued, thank God. Um. Every, early every morning as we get into the word it's time it's not a time to mess around now no time to mess around now if ever there was a time and so here we go just quickly there were seven churches right and they now represent seven church ages and it's absolutely um it's absolutely uh, amazing, all right? I'm just going to touch on a few things very quickly. The first one is the church at Ephesus, okay? The church at Ephesus. And can you remember how Ephesus began? It was in Acts chapter 20, huh? or 19, Acts chapter 19. I'm reading there, you'll find it in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 it's to the letter to the church of Ephesus just quickly what God has to say about them is you, amongst others you'll remember and I, like I say we need another whole Bible study but, but they started in the most amazing way and to them was written Ephesians Ephesians most probably one of the deepest books in God's word when it comes to the doctrines of the New Testament you know, in there, in there is salvation. Remember, we preach through Ephesians, oh. chapter one, being blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All right, speaking about the complete work of, oh, it'll take the whole morning if you can remember. In chapter two, it's it speaks about you had to quicken who were dead in your trespasses and sins, which which, which speaks um, the, defines the gospel amazingly. Uh, in chapter 3, is it about the church of Jesus Christ and God has chosen to show to principalities and powers His manifold wisdom through the church. In chapter 4, it's the five gift ministries. They arrive in chapter 5, is the armor of God, is it chapter 5? And so on and so forth. So it's an amazing book. Um, we're preaching through Thessalonians. You can go through it quickly. It's not as, it's not as meaty. It's not as heavy. But the Ephesian church became mature quickly and God just delivered to them the most incredible truths that we love. And then guess what happens? They leave their first love. They don't lose it. They leave it. When someone says they lost it, say, no, you're misquoting the scripture. The Bible says they left their first love. In other words, they exchanged their first love for something else. And friends, come on. You got saved. What's the biggest thing you're going to fight against? It's losing your first love. Is that right? We get to a point where we don't want to go back to the world. We don't want to go and fornicate and be drunkards anymore. We're glad we left that behind. But our flame begins to dwindle. 
That's the biggest threat to any believer. That's, that's what we've got to hold on to Jesus for. Okay, the next... The next uh, and so that, that was the Ephesian church, right? Um, and then the next church was the church of Smyrna. Just quickly, what it says to them, says to them, um, there's a bit of a prophecy that says, you're going to come under great persecution for 10 days, and many of you are going to die. So what happened straight after the beginning of the Ephesian church, the initial, say, 70 years, whatever, 80 years, straight after that, came the emperors in Rome. Now, I didn't know what wicked people they were until I went there to Rome last year. And they talked us to all these. They were, these actually were stock steering mad. And they persecuted the Christians. You know what they did? They built the Colosseum. They fed them to the lions. They tarred them. They tarred them and they set them alight for streetlights. Right? Amongst others. And they, they pulled them apart. They stretched them. And it's, when you hear it, it's crazy. And guess how long it lasted? Exactly 10 years. 10 days, 10 years. All right? And so, so then we went on to the next church. Okay? Pergamos. All right? I'm just reading notes here. Because, uh, and just quickly, uh, what happened then is after the after I'm gonna just try and okay, Ephesus, Smyrna. Smyrna was ten days, eh? Yeah. Roman persecution. The next one was this. Um, and so what happened was the church became part of the became part of the of the state. And so what happened was is the state began to and it uh, it began to um where's my let me go and read. So compromise setting. That was the next problem. It was compromise. So after Smyrna is Pergamos. Listen to this. I know where you dwell in Satan's seats and you hold the name, uh, the, the holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith, but I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Remember, it was about, uh, they became part of the state and so they, the church then, got power and became wealthy and then they began to adopt they became corrupted so what did remember what Balaam did Balaam was asked to curse Israel he asked God three times God said no he went to them and said easy just send your woman amongst them it won't be long before they fornicate and they'll be sunk that, that's a great prophet huh? and that's how Balaam Balaam caused Israel to fall for money remember he did it for money and so the, what happened was you know, the next church was they became part of the state um, and they were then corrupted by the easy life and so on. All right? Let's go to Thyatira, Thy, Thyatira quickly, which is the next one. All right. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, yeah, so listen to this. It says um, over there, the church of Thyatira. Um, this was so-called church during the dark ages, okay, the church of Thyatira, and um, they entered into the spirit of the, of, of the age. Anyway, I haven't, uh, let me just put it this way. I don't want to waste any time. The things that you'll see just quickly. So you see the initial church, you see the persecuted church, you see the church that becomes part of the govern government. Then you see then you see the church. Um, where was I? Thought Tari, oh that's right. Then let me go and read in the scriptures. You'll see the church that then becomes um, unfortunately we have to say this, the church of Rome. All right? And you see that they, they, they enter into all these rituals. Um, and and um, they become an absolute corrupt church. Listen to this. I have a few things against you, Revelation 2 and 20, because you suffer the woman Jezebel, 
which calleth herself a prophetess, and teach, uh, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. It becomes like a church of idolatry. And uh, very, very, very corrupt and wicked. And I suppose I'll get shot for this, but one thing that shocked me absolutely when I got to Rome is that it's a pagan religion. It is idolatry. The statues and the paintings, it's ridiculous. You just can't believe it. And, and of course, they forbid to marry. They forbid, forbid the priests to marry, which gives rise to adultery fornication. How many men do you know, and women do you know, that don't need to get married? Um, and so on and so forth. So it defines so well the church, Thyatira, the church of during the Roman Catholic age. Okay? Then you had the time of the Reformation, after that, which is the church in chapter 3 and verse 1, which is the church of Sardis. Okay? So what, what, what came from the Roman time would be the, the Roman Catholic time would be the, the Reformation. What was his name? Um, uh, Martin Luther and all his friends. And the church, and there's a, rev and there's a revival. Um, but then, what happened to them? They also became institutionalized. And so in chapter 3, God says to the church of Sardis, listen to this. Um, the church of Sardis, yeah. He says this to them. Uh, where is it? Verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. He says, in the church of Sardis, these things write this. Uh, uh, he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works. And you have a name that you're living, but you're dead. And so, so that is the traditional religion that we all come out of. Okay, where did we come out of? We came out at the end of the Reformation. And what happened to the Reformation? We organized it into, into religious organizations. Um, the, the servants stopped working that were in the hands of God. Um, the, the principle of the body of Christ. And it's quite interesting there. He says... I still have the seven stars in my hands, mm. my gifts, and the seven spirits, which speaks about God, God's ministering spirits, the angels. Yeah. I've got the, they're still in my hand, but you've got a name that you're living, but you're dead. In other words, there's a lot of activity. Um, you've got beautiful churches that you've built, and you've got your, you've got your committees, and you've got your, your clergy, and so on and so forth. But in fact, nothing is happening in your church. It's dead. And so we even see the traditional churches have emptied altogether. Hey, Then the next one is easy to speak about, which is Philadelphia. I believe, to me, that speaks about the true church. Because Jesus has nothing against this church. He says to them, and you are of little strength. Chapter 3, verse 8. It's the true church. All right? Chapter 3, and verse 8. You're of little strength. And it's not, I don't believe, it doesn't say I have someone against thee. He says, you have little strength, and we could preach about that, okay? And then, the last church, and, and that's the end of the church, we, this is the, I would believe this is the compromising modern day church, which encompasses all these mega churches. The mega churches can't fit the pattern of God's word. It's compromising. they they're in competition with the world. They want to be like the world. And so Jesus says to them, listen to this, I know thy works. Are they busy? Lots of works. They all got their programs. Very well organized. He says, but here's my problem. You are neither, you're neither um, cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. And because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And so the modern day church is like the world. It's like the world. What's cold? The world. What's hot? Jesus. So the modern day church is like the world. The gospel is like the world. There's, there, there's no accountability. None. No accountability. Very little is put that way. You can attend those churches. You don't have to change. As long as you put money in the bag. And so on and so forth. And, and listen to this. It says, uh, verse 17, We are rich and increased with goods. And how rich are they? I mean, I've spoken about this in the wind, but have you seen how rich these guys are? 
And it, it goes not just for white Americans and the Africans in Africa. There are churches there where the people are ridiculously wealthy, the pastors. Like over the top, if you see their net worth. And, 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 and they say we're rich, increased with goods, and we have need of nothing. In other words, everything is so well organized. Just look at it. And friends, I don't want to be a prophet of doom, but, but have you seen that most of those mega churches fall? Because the pastor ends up falling into some kind of grosser. You know, and, and I'm not pointing fingers at them. I can tell you, I've thought about it. There's no one in this world, no man, that can resist being exalted. It's actually the people that have created those monsters, not the men themselves. But what happens is, because they see success, they see success, the, the congregation, they begin to elevate the man, they begin to pay him more, because they say to him, he's doing such a great job, you need to earn more. And when you read the Bible, all the disciples were poor. Um, the, the early church never had, in fact, you don't read of them owning any buildings. Do you know that? You don't read in the book of Acts, and they bought a building in every town. I'm not saying it's wrong. It was a church that operated by the power of God under the tree or in someone's house. And it was not known for their wealth, but for the power of God that was working. I'm not saying anything wrong with churches. We need churches. It's practical here and there. But, but the, 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 the modern day church is exactly as it's defined over here. And then Jesus, of course, says to them, You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. And he says to them, I counsel you to buy of me gold. Now what can that gold be? It can only be the word of God. Oh. Tried in fire. In other words, it's been proven over the years. And, uh, and that you can be rich, truly rich, not rich in this world. Real riches is the riches that God's word, the, the, the kingdom of God gives us. White raiment speaks about holiness. All right? True, true righteousness, true that you might be clothed and the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes solve that you might see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I will open the door and come in, and he will sup with me. So where's Jesus at the end of the age? He's outside of his own church, knocking on the door, asking please to come in. Now, I'm glad it's in my book, because it's a serious book. What do you say? It's a serious book, this. Very serious. These are, this doesn't give me a great feeling to read. It actually, I actually get scared. I get worried when I read that. Because I know many people will not agree with what this says. But if you look around you, just look around you. Just observe. Be discerning. This is the day. So where are we living? Well, we're living between Ch Sardis and Laodicea. You find the little church of Philadelphia. As someone once said, it was the good church in a bad neighborhood. That's exactly where we are. I hope. You must speak for yourself. You've got to make up your own mind. The true church is the good church. On the one side, on the one side we've got the traditional churches that give us On the other side, you've got people that say nothing is happening here because we, our worship's not hot because it's not geared towards the people it needs to be directed towards God that's what worship is quite challenging isn't it I just say Lord Jesus come please as soon as possible it's very selfish I know that there are many that need Jesus but, but you wonder, in, in the time we're living in, it's really, and I'm just encouraging us this morning. Remember, God gives us to warn us, to confirm that He might save us. Are you with me? And let's stick to what the Bible says, the Word of God says. We can't move from what the Bible says. We just cannot move. When, and, and we can, I know. I mean, I've been through all emotions. You guys are still kind of near it. I've been through, I, I could tell you story after story. It's amazing how, when I was a young man, I always had a calling in my life to go and minister. Always I wanted to. And I was like, standard nine, 
10. My, my uncle and aunt went the wrong route. They were preachers, but they went this route. And, and they had a church in East London. And my aunt is a great musician. My, my, my uncle um, she's a, was a great piano player. And my uncle was an incredible, incredible... And he was not he was a it was not this crazy dynamic preacher, but he was such a dynamic leader. Such a dynamic man. Tall guy, always dressed in communicated well and was a great shepherd. And they fell into the trap of, of going this route. And we went to visit there one Easter once. And it was I love music. And my aunt was playing the grand piano and there was the band and they said, Bring a guitar. And I played, I played that one song that's quite nice and they practiced we played a little solo and afterwards they gave me money <laughs> you know, for playing for the Sunday you know, and, and it's amazing how, how you think well I could kind of get used to this you know this is this is like and the, and, and everything was uh, unfortunately my lord the lord had to collect my correct my uncle he fell in the bathroom broke his neck became a quadriplegic that was how's that for a freak accident and all of this was taken away. It was a very successful church, and he came back to earth, and didn't and he didn't lose his salvation. Um, he became very effective, and from his wheelchair, he would share with the ones in twos again, and they made a full circle, and they're back in fellowship with us, so, and all the whole family's back in fellowship. But all I'm just saying is, those emotions have often. Then I've, I've I always joke some days when I'm having a bad day. If we're nothing, there's only one other real English church, the Baptist church. I thought. And he's got such a nice church and he doesn't work on Mondays. And when you see he's on the golf course, I said, no way. I want a, I want a job like that. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm just exerting myself too much. Maybe I should have an office and people should come to me, you know. <laughs> like, like, and I'm not being nasty, but we're tempted all the time. The devil's not going to leave you alone because you live in Frankfurt. You're going to find you guys are going to be tempted by the left. All your chummies. Here's my last story for the morning. Uh, Yaku told me the story. Someone, someone that Yaku knows, Yaku Nadine, and uh, he was chatting to yours, and they were at the same failing or something. And uh, so he was to yours from Lindley. So this guy says, You know Yaku? So he says, Yeah, I know him. Have you heard the story? So he says, Died Malchachan, right? He's 80 kerkheid. Will this get done? Ik woon op Pratt en Tyler daar. Hulle, hulle is nou op hulle, hulle is nou daar met, op hulle plaas. Daar is mal. Joos sê, ek is nie so lekker. <laughs> ek is Joos 10 punten wat hy aan wat gegeen. En I'm not fighting with the people, but you will feel this pressure, and you will feel that pressure. We need to stick to what the Bible says. And Jesus is coming. So that was a long one. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And uh, how blessed we are. Lord, I pray for us. Pray for myself. Before I pray for anyone else. Lord, keep, keep us. Keep me, Lord Jesus. Lord, help me to keep my eyes on you. And I pray that for all of us. I pray that for our fellowships. I pray for everyone. Lord, when the pressure is on, help us to remember that you told us. You gave us revelation. You gave us many parables that we might know. Lord, from where we're standing, it looks like you're coming very soon. And even if you don't come in our lifetime, Lord, eternity is a long time compared to 50 years down here. Help us to serve you with all of our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.